Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ophelia Rowe Allen. I am the Director of Residence Life. And today we will be discussing um, Sophomore Residential College, the program that we have here for over 17 years here at Fairfield. We'll also be looking at general housing select, talking about general housing selection. And to my left, I have two of my colleagues that will be helping me. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Marianne Neville. I'm the mentor coordinator for the Sophomore Residential College program. And I am also um, an alum and a parent of an alum of both the university and the Sophomore Residential College program. And my name is Charles Souza. I'm the Senior Associate Director of Housing Operations here at Fairfield. Um, I primarily oversee the implementation of the housing lottery process. Um, I've been here for about 13 years. Um, and um, in my time here, I have been a mentor in the Ignatian Residential Leadership College for seven years. And so we want to start, it, uh, start out with um, what is the Sophomore Residential College program? Um, here at Fairfield University, it has been here for 17 years. And it is a very student center um, program in which we merge student living experiences and academics um, to integrate it with the, with, with the educational experience. And so what are some of the things that happen um, in this program? We do have retreats, we do have dinners, we have, there is an academic component that we have to the program, um, in addition to the residential component, service trips that happen, and all of these um, help to empower the students to live an integrated life here at Fairfield. And so I'll turn it over to Marianne to talk about what, um, specifically what are some of the components we have. Thank you, Ophelia. So there are really three major areas of the residential college program, academic, mentoring, and intentional living. And the first component is really the academic component. In the academic component, we have a variety of courses that are residential college courses, and these are courses taught by dedicated faculty who are enhancing their course curriculum to answer the three major questions of the program, which are who am I, who, who am I, whose am I, and how am I called in the world. Um, in our students take a course each semester and one residential college course each semester and there's a wide variety of these courses that are in their major fields of study as well as in the core curriculum. Last semester some of the courses that were offered included money and banking, literature of illness and healing, history of global humanitarian action, healthcare delivery systems, digital photography, so there's a wide variety for, of about 30 courses for the students to choose from. The second component of the program is mentorship, and this is a very key part of our program. Um, using the residential college course that your students select, they're placed in groups of five to eight students, all who have decided to take the same course. And they are um, matched with an adult mentor. And our mentors are drawn from the university community. We have university staff, faculty, Jesuits, alumni, as well as local community civic leaders that volunteer to serve as companions to your student as they um, go through this journey of self reflection and discovery in their sophomore year. And the mentors really facilitate monthly meetings where they meet with the students and discuss um, different parts of the program as well as what's going on in their community they're living in and their coursework. The third part of the program is the intentional living, and this is a um, hallmark part of our program where our students live in intentional communities um, and they're supervised and um, um, managed by our residential life staff who arrange programs that are um, surround the ideas of the specific program. Some of the um, programs that they have include, as Ophelia mentioned, faculty and dinner series, um, weekly plans, spontaneous programs re uh, on topics from current events to sports to seasonal activities. Um, we also have retreats. We have a fall and a winter retreat. In the fall, it's a one-day retreat at the beginning of the semester, which is at the beginning of the year, and the students are really focusing on getting to know each other as well as getting to know their mentor. The winter retreat 
is then an overnight retreat, and it's held off campus um, at a nearby uh, lodge. And um, that time is a really exciting time in the program. The students are coming back at the beginning of their second semester. They've gotten to know each other. They're focusing more on um, maybe going forward, things they might be interested in, deciding their majors, looking at internships, career opportunities. So it tends to be a very um, exciting time in the program. And then lastly, I'd mention is service opportunities. We have a number of service opportunities for students in the res colleges. Um, and these opportunities, I think, serve two purposes. First, they're a tremendous bonding experience for the mentor groups. In small mentor groups, they will go out and do service opportunities. They can elect to do things like serve in a nearby um, soup kitchen or a homeless shelter. We have after school programs in some of the local Bridgeport elementary schools that the students can go and volunteer at with their mentor. We even have um, things like a Halloween party that one of the residential colleges put on on campus and invited local community um, children to come and participate in. And so the next part is talking about the benefits. And, I, and I'm sure you, you are wondering, why um, should my son or daughter um, be in this program? Just to, um, to let you know that there are over 450 students, sophomore students, which is half, almost half of the sophomore class that is um, part of this program. And so some of the benefits um, are when it comes down to the academics, you have their majors. You know, sophomore year is a time where we call it the sophomore slump. So students may be coming in with no majors undeclared, or they have a major and they may be thinking, you know, what am I called? Uh, uh, who am I uh, I'm called to be? And, and what is it that I really want to do? And if this major is right for me. And in addition, there are also um, long-life friendships. Long-life friendships that up until now, students are friends with each other. Um, after they have graduated from Fairfield. Mm -hmm. So there is an impact um, there. And I will also turn it over to Marianne, who is also a parent <laughs> um, and have experience with her daughter being through the Ignatian Leadership Residential College. Yes, thanks, Ophelia. Yeah, I was I agree so much with this. Both I've had both um, my daughter and a niece who graduated from the university and was in the residential college. And um, I think we, I can't stress enough what a wonderful opportunity this is for for your so student going into their sophomore year. As, as Ophelia said, that they are coming back. They're, they're not new. Some of the, they have their sea legs. Some of the anxiety that accompany them in the newness of freshman year is gone. But they're also, they're, they're not completely settled. Maybe they haven't found yet exactly what they want to study. Maybe they haven't settled on a group or a community that they want to be part of. And the sophomore residential college provides a built-in network and structure for them to meet friends in their living arrangement, in their classes, and to have something in common to go forward with them. And I think they take both these friendships and what they learn forward. I found this experience with both my daughter and my niece far after they leave the residential college in their additional years at the university and then beyond. I was recently speaking to one of them and I said, well, do you still keep in touch with your mentor? Do you hear once in a while? And she and my niece said, oh, you know, I, she, he just emailed me um, the other day because he, saw, because he saw on LinkedIn that I had received a promotion at work. So there's these are lifelong relationships that we're starting to build here. And I just think it's a tremendous opportunity at a time when students really are looking to sort of reach out and connect with others. And so the, the last part of it, we, we just want to stress the three, the three different kinds um, of areas that we focus on in the residential college. We have Creative Life um, Residential College, we have Ignatian Leadership Residential College, and we have the Social Justice Residential College. And, and for the Creative Life, it's really, uh, we want students to talk about it, two main questions um, for all of them. Um, it's who am I and whose am I? And how am I called to live a creative and examined life? And it's not just students who are in the arts that we ask to be in this program, but we want um, students to think creative um, when they are solving problems, when they have to work in groups, right? How do they do that? And, and how do they cope? Um, there are times where when they either have some um, concern in their classrooms 
or outside of the classrooms and they want to find creative ways of how to handle it. For the, um, for the service for justice, we think of identity. Um, we, we help students to think about their own identity. Again, those same two questions of who am I and whose am I? But the third question is how am I called to serve justice? And it is well said already, social justice, which is a process, but also a goal in which students want to live to say, how can I live a just life, a caring life? And so how do they look at the current issues, things that are happening, but also when we look at our Jesuit values of who we are, um, men and women for and with others. And so for Ignatian leadership, um, Marianne, do you want to talk about that? Um, I think Ignatian leadership, I would say, is, is a really unique program as well because the students are focusing on um, the three questions, as Ophelia said, who am I, um, whose am I, and how am I called to lead? And here's, I think, a, a unique opportunity. This is where we sort of challenge our students to think about, okay, what do you want to study? What do you want to do with that? Where do you want to go? Where do you see yourself in five years? How can you incorporate your values and what you, what you hold dearest to yourself into what you're going to seek in a profession. And I'm sure these are all things that you've heard your students, um, your children speaking with um, at, about at home, but I think it's an opportunity for to them to discuss it and explore it with other students and with people who are um, mentors who are professionals. Uh, I don't think I mentioned that, but our, uh, we've got the Mentors are drawn from a wide variety of fields, including education, healthcare, um, law, the arts, uh, business. So they have the opportunity to be exposed when they're thinking about leading and leadership to many people who've had a wide variety of careers and will, who can talk with them about where their career has led them as well. And so finally for this part, we want to go into logistics because you must be wondering where are they going to live and how does this work for their sophomore year? So there is a residential college application. And so this application opens um, December 1st and it closes January 25th. And we will accept students, we'll read their application and acceptance letters will be sent out in March. And so once students are accepted into the Res College, they have, um, their housing is secured. They, have, they will also have a chance to decline if they don't want to be there anymore. But just to also note, they may be thinking that, you know, I have a roommate, I have someone that I want to live with. They can apply together. Hmm. And we, we encourage them um, to also do that because then they will have the same mindset going in in terms of what is it that I'm looking for, right, in this program. And both of them will, will decide that, okay, we will need to live together. This is what we want to do. And so they will have an opportunity to have a roommate selection on April 1st and which closed April 8th. And we are all doing everything online. You will hear them talk about the housing director, which Charlie will talk more about. Um, but that is our housing software that is totally online for all students. And that is where they will pick their housing and also pick their roommates. And, and finally, we will have, if there are times where um, for groups who may not have someone, um, say I don't have a roommate, we will also have time for them to find um, a roommate. And so, Charlie, I think we are finished with Res Colleges, and we're going to turn it over to Charlie Sousa, the Associate Director um, in Residence Life, to talk about the, the other part of sophomore housing for students who said, you know what, I don't think I want to be in this program. Charlie. All right, slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so um, when looking at um, both the uh, residential college housing as well as uh, the non-res college housing um, you're looking at some very different options for housing altogether so um, the first option are creative life residential college is housed in Loyola Hall um, which is a traditional style building um, students for the creative life residential college will live on the first and second floors with the third floor being for the non-residential college students um, all these rooms are double rooms. They will share a community bathroom, um, and everything is co-ed by wing. Um, the Leadership Residential College is in house in 42 Langeth Road, um, which is our new building, which we just opened up this past August. 
Um, this is a suite style housing of four person suites and eight person suites. Um, they have a shared bathroom within the suite um, and all suites are single gendered, but there are um, different gendered suites on the same floor. Uh, but because the bathrooms are housed within the individual suites, um, you can have a male suite right next to a female suite because they have their own bathroom facilities. Um, and our service for justice residential college is housed in 70 McCormick Road, um, which is also a traditional style hall with double rooms. Um, there are community bathrooms on each floor um, and the building is co-ed by floor. Um, for our non-res college housing options, um, these would be students who elect not to participate in the res college option. Um, they do have the option of living in Loyola Hall um, on the third floor, which is a traditional style hall. Um, they will use the communal bathrooms as well as be co-ed by wing. Um, and then we have Casca, Claver, and Faber Hall, which are all suite style halls. Um, uh, the suite style rooms are defined because they do have their own bathroom facility within the suites. Both Casca and Claver Hall um, are two double rooms conjoined by the bathroom, whereas Faber Hall is a large four person room with a bathroom connected to the room that only that suite would use. Um, Casca, Claver, and Faber are all in the village side of campus, which is on the south side of campus. Um, as for the nuts and bolts and how we do things and the general housing selection, um, our lottery system, it's a random lottery system, so each student gets their own individual lottery number. Um, so when they're creating groups and they're figuring things out, um, once they've created their groups, they'll be assigned um, an individual lottery number. Um, the lowest lottery number in each created group will be the lottery number that represents the group. And this is both for the res college and non-res college. That will determine the pick order time, um, so when students are assigned to pick their rooms. Um, students are responsible for creating their own groups and making sure that the group sizes do match up with what we have for housing. So for example, um, Loyola is a traditional hall, so students will need to have one other person with them to go in as groups of two to select double rooms. Whereas in uh, Languth and Casca, Claver, and Faber, those are all suite style housing, so they do need to have a complete group of four, um, or in the event that they're in 42 Languth, they would need to have a complete group of eight in order to select the suite during the housing lottery process. Um, they'll be selecting on the specific date, which we'll get into a little bit more later, um, but they will be given a very specific time to do it. Um, as you can see here, uh, for our non-residential college, as I mentioned, it's for two or four um, students in single gendered groups. The room selection is gonna be on April 12th will start at 9 a.m. in the morning and will continue on until all the housing is selected by those students. Um, for the residential college students, it's important to remember that there are actually two separate processes that they do need to go through. The first process is to go through and apply for and be accepted into the residential college. Once they've applied for the residential college and they've been accepted, they then need to go through the housing lottery process this is where they will select their complete groups, whether it's connecting with another roommate or filling out their entire suite. Um, students will be notified prior to the actual lottery process in mid-March that they are being accepted into the residential college program, which will give them time to select and find roommates, complete their roommate groups, um, be notified of what their lottery pick times are, and select their housing on April 12th. Uh, some important dates and deadlines to remember is the housing lottery applications, this is for all students to fill out, opens on February 20th at 9 a.m. Um, and they'll be able to go through as uh, long as their lottery process is open to complete the housing lottery application. They can also do the roommate selection once they've completed the housing application. Um, 
students do need to complete the housing application before they're eligible to move on to the roommate selection. So if a roommate hasn't completed the housing application yet, um, students will not be able to find them in the lottery system. So it's important to remember that they follow the steps in the process. So step one would be complete the housing lottery application. Step two would be the roommate selection, and this is both for res college and non-res college student. That process opens on April 1st at 9 a.m., closing on April 8th at 4 p.m. So they need to select their roommates and be connected and accepted by the roommates that they've selected to complete their roommate group before they can move on to the room selection process. On April 10th, we will notify all students by 4 p.m of what their lottery numbers are and what their specific pick time is. Um, and their room selection, again, will start both for non-res college and res college students on April 12th at 9 a.m. Um, so now we're gonna turn it over to Zach, who's helping moderate um, with us to see if you guys have any questions that we can answer for you. We do have a question to start off. Uh, are the residential college courses also offered to sophomores not in a residential college and do the classes satisfy other requirements for graduation or are they just considered additional courses? Um, for first, um, the classes open, the courses are open up to first to the residential college students. If there are um, spaces remaining in that class, other sophomores can sign up to be in that class also. Yes, it is either a core class or sometimes a major, uh, um, a course for their major. So it does fulfill either the core or their major. Cool. Uh, another question. Are residential colleges very exclusive? Are they cut off from the rest of the school, the rest of the student body? No, not at all. Um, I think that, um, as Ophelia mentioned, about 40 percent of the, 40 to 50 percent of the sophomores actually are living in these colleges. Um, so they're very much um, socializing in all of their classes with all of the other students as well. And in fact, all of the residential college um, housing buildings are on the quad, so they are actually living in community with all of the other sophomores. Does that answer? Yeah. Um, another logistical question about, I guess, mm -hmm. what campus looks like. Uh, what housing is in the village? Um, the village actually encompasses um, probably the second largest area that we have on campus. Um, in the village area, you have Casca, Claver, and Faber Halls, which are all sophomore buildings. It also houses 47 Mahan Road and Meditz Hall, which are upperclassmen apartment style buildings where juniors and seniors live. Uh, another awesome question. If your child is in the honors program, how do these residential college options work with that? Sure. Um, I, we, if you're in the honors program, you can also be in the residential college um, program. And many of the students that are in honors are also in the residential college program. Um, I, my understanding is that honors takes one course a semester, um, and uh, you know your student has five courses that they can take. And in fact, I, I'm not certain, but I think there's a possibility that some of the courses may count for both as well. Is that correct? Uh, another question. What happens when students don't find a full group for the housing lottery? Um, so w we actually do offer a lot of different opportunities for students to find um, a roommate pairing. Um, we'll do general roommate finder nights um, within the Office of Residence Life, allowing them to go out and meet individuals who are also looking to create complete groups. Um, to finalize their lottery groups. Um, the individual area coordinator, so the buildings that your students do live in, um, they'll also be hosting roommate finder nights um, as an opportunity for students to kind of go out and connect face to face with other students um, who may be in a similar situation. Um, for example, if you have two students who really would like to be in Costco or Claver Hall, um, but there's only two of them, they have an opportunity to go out and meet other doubles who are also hoping to get into Costco and Claver Hall. So they can combine together and make a complete group of four and enter the lottery that way. Um, 
We also do have something we affectionately call the roommate finder binder in the Office of Residence Life. <laughs> so any students who are looking for roommates to either complete a group or if they're an individual student and um, they haven't found a roommate pairing that you know kind of meets their housing lifestyle preferences, um, they do have the opportunity to fill that out as well. Um, so as students are dropping in the Office of Residence Life looking for direction on how do I find a roommate? Where can I find a roommate? Um, we always point them to the roommate finder nights, but um, we also encourage them to look through the roommate finder binder as well as going through and looking um, and participating in um, some of the other events that we have on campus to connect with those students. Awesome. Uh, we got another question. This might just be going back to what you guys were talking about before, but could you maybe just go over again the types of residential colleges? Just the so we have um, we have Creative Life Residential College, we have the Service for Justice Residence Life uh, um, Residential College, and we have Ignatian Leadership Residential Colleges. And all of this you can find on our website. There's a description um, on our website, and there's also the link to the application on our website. Cool. Uh, question about tours. Mm -hmm. Could Residence Life coordinate an activity that includes tours of all the housing options that are available for sophomores? Great idea. <laughs> yes, we do do that. So there are, especially for the residential colleges, we do have what we call open houses that will be taking place where students can, um, we, ha we have a lot of signature programs in those, um, in, in, the, in the three areas. And so students have the opportunity on either on a Monday night where they go to Service for Justice for Munchy Monday night um, to get a feel where other students will talk to them about the program, but also to give them a tour of the building. Uh, for 42 Longuth, we do have happy hour um, on, I think on Tuesday night. Wednesday, Wednesday night. Yeah. Sorry, Char <laughs> thank you, Charlie. And then on Wednesday for, um, for Creative Life, we have Tasty Tuesday. And so this is an opportunity for students to go through the building, um, talk to residents, get even to visit the rooms. Um, some of the rooms will be open um, for students to see. Casca Claver, the same thing, and Faber um, will have some programs, but we do encourage students to go on their own and um, to knock on students' doors. We will be telling them that students will be coming through. And so if they want, and if they have friends there too, because some of them do make friends with the sophomores, um, to go there and to see what the rooms look like. Awesome. Uh, we have a question about the honors program. Mm -hmm. Is it true that honors program students will be assigned to the new dorm 42 Langeth? No, they will not. So what, um, there is a first year living and learning honors program that we do have. But when it comes to the sophomore year, we want our students to have different experiences. And we want to expose them to all the resources um, that we have here at Fairfield and what they can take uh, and the different opportunities they do have. So no, they will not be going automatically going into the new building, into 42 Longos. What we, we gave all the honor students an opportunity to, to apply to our residential colleges if they want. So it's an option for them. Cool. Um, another question about the housing process and the lottery. Do you apply to a res college as a group? For example, what if not everyone in your roommate group gets in? You apply to the residential colleges in two. So you can apply, you can apply with another student. So you don't go beyond two. Cool. Um, another question, what about non-res college students? They should be able to see all available dorms. Will, uh, will that happen as a planned event rather than knocking on doors? Can you repeat that? Uh, what about non-res college students? They should be able to see all available dorms. What will happen? Will that happen as a planned event rather than knocking on doors? Yes, the resident assistants will be also doing that. But we do, and as I said, we do encourage students, if they have friends, um, that they can seek out that opportunity also. But yes, the resident assistant will be holding info sessions type in the building where if they want a tour, um, they can sign up and they can be at a certain point. Normally, they would meet in the lounges, um, in one of the lounges um, for, um, before the tour begins. Cool. Uh, question about study abroad. Can a student live in a res college if they're on study abroad for part of the year? Yes. We do have um, our summer, our, our sophomore study abroad program. Not many students um, go on it, but they, um, when they get back, normally they will go in the fall, 
and we they will contact us before the spring semester to say that they would like to still be part of the residential college program and um, we will place them once they get back and Marianne will place them into a mentor group. Yes, yeah, and we actually try to even assign them a mentor group before they go. As Ophelia said, there are not many uh, that many students that do that, but um, so that if there are things going on in their mentor group, the, the group will reach out to them. We've had occasions where they've sometimes Skyped with the group or you know at least email back and forth with so they kind of get a feel of what they're talking about and what's going on in the community while they're studying abroad. Cool. Um, we have another question about emails and communication. Mm -hmm. Can ResLife send out emails to students for tour slash info session events? Yes. So if you could um, encourage your student to go on OrgSync there is a residence life orcsing page and that is where most of our communication we will send emails to them but sometimes they do turn off the um, the notification for orcs orcsing so they don't get the um what, what some of the events that are happening there are is there are also flyers in the building that's going to be on um, the RA's doors and on the bulletin boards and um charlie um will also send emails with um, the, the housing lottery process, and if there are going to be events, if there are going to be planned events, um, we will also put that in there. Cool. Um, and then a question about the housing lottery. When does the lottery application open for the students? February 20th for the actual housing lottery application process. Um, the residential college application, as we mentioned, is separate from the actual housing lottery process. Um, so that process actually opens for the residential colleges on December 1st. Um, those are due February 25th. So as you can see, we're wrapping up the residential college process um, as well as opening up the actual housing lottery process. This allows the students the opportunity to um, go through and have a better idea of what direction they're going in before our housing lottery process actually begins with respect to either going to the non-res college option or the residential college option. Cool, and we have a follow, following question about being a mentor. Can juniors and seniors who lived in residential colleges become mentors in sophomore residential colleges? Actually, that's a very good question. Um, they cannot be mentors, and as I mentioned, our mentors are our um, adult people who, mm -hmm. uh, adults who have um, are sort of in community in their um, profession, uh, be it on campus or off uh, outside in the wider community. But we do have a program called Alumni Mentorship, and it, it's a it's a great program. And it's students who have completed the residential college program can um, apply to be alumni mentors. And we actually this year have almost an alumni mentor for each mentor group. And what that alumni mentor, as somebody who has gone through the program, what they do is they work with the adult mentor um, to sort of plan the uh, meetings and attend the meetings. And they, they serve as an excellent um, bridge between the students who are just beginning the program, having had the experience of going, having gone through it already and now being an upperclassman, and then our adult mentors. So. It's, um, it's really, and, and we are very excited to see that so many of our students who are res college students um, really want to apply to be alumni mentors, that they're interested in doing it. And just one point on that, as Ophelia was mentioning before, um, I would really encourage you to talk to your um, students about the program and encourage them to reach out even informally to the res colleges. The students love it in these programs and they're more than willing to talk about it or if somebody just comes in on one of these munchy Monday, tasty Tuesday, I don't know what they call Wednesday, happy hour, happy hour. <laughs> um, and um, they're always welcoming and that's the that's really uh, part of the hallmark of it. It's a very enthusiastic group of students who are very excited to be part of it and I'm sure they they would welcome having anybody come and attend and tell them a little bit about the program. But on a side note, there are mentor uh, mentorship programs at Fairfield outside of the residential yes. college. 
for if your student um, in their sophomore year decide they want to be part of a peer mentor group, we do have our Cure, Cure Personalis mentoring program. So if they want to help first year students coming in next year to transition to Fairfield and to help them with their transition, um, they can also um, apply. And that will be um, next semester, late next semester. Um, I don't have the date right now when the application will be going out. Cool. We have a question about the res colleges working together. Do the residential colleges collaborate with each other? Yes, they do. They do a lot. On service trips, um, they also, when we have different programs, I, um, I think probably a few weeks ago, they did go to New York um, to watch, I'm not sure if it's Wicked. Yeah. Um, and so we, um, we try at all times to, to let that happen. We also have um, where all our mentors, and Marion can speak to this, will come together at some point from all three residential college um, to talk about their experiences and what they um, have been seeing when it, when it comes on to the growth and development um, of the students. But we do collaborate a lot. Um, they do a lot of cross-programming because they're in the quad. Yeah, uh, yes, we definitely do. And we, um, and we encourage them to um, work, we've got a couple of pilot programs this year where they're working actually with different faculty members. So you might have a mentor group, you might have some students that are taking a residential college course that are in service for justice, and there might be another group of students that are taking it in uh, the leadership college, and they may both be in the same class with the same professor. So two mentors might work with them. Um, we have this with the Global Humanitarian course this year, where they are doing some impactful activities. Um, this past uh, two weeks ago, we had um, a Syrian refugee simulation that was held on campus, and the humanitarian uh, class paired with some of the different mentor groups to help staff that for people to go through. But uh, as Ophelia said, they definitely do collaborate, and we do. With respect to the mentors, we, we spend um, a good amount of time developing our mentors and working with them to make sure that they are meeting sort of the needs of our students and hearing what the questions are and what concerns are of our students. So we meet um, each month with our mentors in the individual res colleges and we come together a couple of times a year as a larger group with mentors and faculty um, to talk about the issues. Cool. Um, I think we have a question here about Loyola. Um, do students who live in Loyola that aren't in residential colleges, are they privy to participate in res college events? Absolutely. So the, um, the resident assistants there, they know that all the programs that they put on in the residence hall, uh, um, in Loyola Hall, are for all students. Um, the only um, part that they do not participate in is the mentor groups. But there are times during the semester where students um, in, the, in the residential college program will talk to other students, and so that particular student may say, you know what, I think I want to be part of it. So, so, so we will put them in, um, in mentor groups. But the only thing for, is just that the mentor groups that they don't readily participate in. But all the programs are open. It's one big lounge. It's a, it's, um, they're very fortunate. The only um, building to have a soda machine, <laughs> um, a coffee machine, and a tea. And, and tea. So there is constant... Um, drinks and so for them to have and to hang out in the lounge together. We have a question about sophomore dorms. Do sophomore dorms have lounges on floors where the sophomores are living? This was not the case for freshmen and I feel it was a detriment for students getting to know everyone on the floor. We understand that Regis Hall is the only um, first year residential um, residence hall that do not have a lounge on every floor. We will be changing and we will be making um, changes um, to that. So, but in the in the sophomore um, residence hall, we do have lounges on each floor. Um, the only thing for Casca Claver, which is a sweet style building, um, our lounges are open. They look like open spaces, so there is not a door. Um, but we are working on that to find other spaces where students can use in addition to the library. Cool. Um, wow, this is a great question here. Could you estimate the amount of time a sophomore would spend each week on res college specific activities, meeting service trips, et cetera, and are all of the activities mandatory? Um, the activities, uh, okay. 
That's a good question, let's say. <laughs> so um, first of all, the activities are not mandatory. I mean, they, man they in terms of the requirements, they have to take a course each semester, which is one of their five courses that they're taking. They have to participate in the mentor group, which means they have to attend the monthly meeting with the mentor and their smaller community of five to eight students if there's you know an emergency or we occasionally have things that the mentors are very understanding but the idea is it's for them to get something out of so the expectation is that they will go to that monthly meeting and then in addition we have the two retreats one as I mentioned that's a day retreat in the fall that's held on a Saturday on campus and then we have an overnight retreat shortly after they uh, come back from um, winter break and it's one night either a Friday or a Saturday night um, and we expect that they'll attend that too so though that's really I think the expectations right of the man mm -hmm. mandatory expectations of the program beyond that um, in terms of the service opera and actually service for justice I think has as a requirement they they're expected to do one service program one time um, during the year the rest of it is really up to the student and up to the mentor group and um, you we just find that in terms of the service opportunities the students are excited about this we we had a thing last year at our spring retreat um, or our winter retreat where we had a competition a service competition it was kind of like a shark tank type thing where the students all gr different mentor groups all competed against each other to see who could come up with the best idea for a service opportunity so they love that because they love the competition and the group that won we said whoever won we would um, fund it so that they would be able to do this well it was a wonderful experience the uh, it was hard to choose there were so many good opportunities and we wound up pairing like two together and the uh, um, the opportunity that one where the students wanted to bring a group of students from a middle school in Bridgeport to our university campus for the day uh, or for the they came like midday and we ha and they engaged them in all sorts of things there were um, sports activities up at the recplex they had them do an arts and craft activity with an art history professor that we had um, they exposed and they oh they got to eat in the tali which was a big thing for the middle schoolers so it, that's what I'm saying there's a real level of enthusiasm but it's really up to the students um, same thing I'd say with the events that go on in the individual res colleges. As Ophelia was mentioning, these are all things that the students want to go to. You know, it's, you know they'll say, oh, stop by. So um, very often it just depends on if they're free. But I would say the average res college student maybe stops into something once or twice a week. Do mm -hmm. you think that's about right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You know, one of the things I also want to mention for the requirement um, for the mentor groups, it's only an hour per month, oh, yes. right? Uh, just an hour um, that they will have to meet. For the, the retreat, it's a requirement that they go, um, that, that they attend. It's a commitment. Our mentors are also committed. Just so that the mentors are there on the, uh, on the retreat also. So we want to ensure that the students are there and they want to participate. And students really find a sense of belonging um, in this program, right? This is where they may have a rough first year, you know, in, in, in forming community, forming friendship, because they're just transitioning to Fairfield. It's a new experience for them. But getting into the rest colleges, you can see where they form stronger bonds um, with students who they didn't even know. Sometimes it, it's not the roommate that they have chosen because they apply alone. And so when they get that new roommate, they are some of them now are still friends even after um, the rest college program has ended in their sophomore year. Cool. Uh, we have a logistical question about the layouts of the rooms. Uh, quick question about the suites. One bathroom for four rooms or one big room for four and one bathroom, or how are the suites set up? So the suites are set up, whether it be Casca and Claver or Faber, it's four students sharing one bathroom. Um, so there would be a toilet, a sink, or in some cases two sinks, and a shower for all four students to use, um, which is um, a better ratio than they would get living in a traditional hall 
with the number of facilities that are in there for the students. Um, and the students kind of figure it out as they go throughout the semester and who needs to use the bathrooms and the showers at which time. Um, who's brushing their teeth, who's taking a shower, who's using the bathroom. <laughs> they all figure that out within the first couple of days and um, knowing when they can get in, when they can't get in. And um, we very rarely get complaints about that. And usually when we do, it's because somebody's hogging a shower and taking an hour shower while everyone else in the suite's waiting to take one. Cool. Uh, I, I guess another logistical question. How close are the sophomore residential colleges to each other? And are they close to other dorms that aren't residential colleges? So um, all of our sophomore residential colleges are on our quad. Um, so all the buildings pretty much on campus, whether you're on the quad or not, are within walking distance of one another. I, students tend to say, you know, get concerned about, well, all my friends are living in a res college and they're on the quad and I'm living down in the village area. And realistically, like, it's a very short walk. It should take no more than 10 minutes to walk there. You know, the quad's on one side of the BCC and the village area's on the other side of the BCC. So all they really have to do is walk through that one building and they're connected to the other part of campus to visit their friends. Cool. So for the rest colleges, if you, if you could just remember when moving day happens. So if you are in Regis, 42 Longoth is on the left-hand side. And if you are in Jogues, um, 70 McCormick is on the right-hand side. If you are in Campion Hall, Loyola is right across. So which means you are 30 seconds away from each building. Okay. And Gonzaga. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I guess one of our final questions, uh, how many per room? We're talking about like in the suites, two rooms with two or one big room with four. I guess just kind of rehash the... Yeah, so Casca and Claver are two double rooms conjoined by a bathroom, whereas Faber Hall is one large room with four students living in it um, with a bathroom attached to that suite. Cool, I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. very much.